we haven't completely started yet. We just like talking about different practices and Austin is sharing about his cover cropping. Um, so really, really cool stuff. Um, we'll get started guys. I got uh, about one o'clock and yeah, Sean, I know you kind of have a tight schedule today, but um, uh, we really, you know, as Farmers Union um, goes, we have a deep passion in soil health and in our, our environment um, and to our producers um, to help them in any way we can to uh, raise the best crops they can uh, the most eh, cost effective way, I guess you could say. And uh, we have been doing these egg producer hour series for a few weeks now, and we really wanted to hit on soil health. And uh, so many, uh, so many topics are out there right now. So many con conversations about soil health. And you know, if you're like me, you might be wondering, well, well, what is all the buzz about soil health? So we wanted to address that uh, in this video series today. Um, with us today is Austin Carlson with South Dakota Health Coalition. He's a technician uh, based in Flandreau. Is that right, Austin? Yeah, I've been working from home for a while, but yep. Sure, but covering that area. Uh, and then we have uh, Sean Freeland, who, uh, Sean, you're the vice chair. Is that correct? Right. Vice That's chairman, um, South, Dakota South, South Dakota Soil Health Coalition as well, joining us uh, from Caputa, South Dakota. So um, both very knowledgeable folks with soil health, and we're just glad to have them with us today. So uh, without further ado, I know there's uh, good information, Austin, that you have and that you can share with us. Um, again, we're just focused on, you know, I guess the basics of soil health, you know, what is all the buzz about? Um, and, you know, how can it, how can it help producers? Um, that's, that's the big question. Um, you know, what, uh, what are the economics to it and why does it really matter? So uh, Austin, I'll hand it over to you, man. Okay, well, I'm not gonna take too much time because I, I want Sean to, he's gotta leave at two. So we're gonna fly through this a little bit. But the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition is producer led. So we've got nine board members across the state. We've got six employees. Uh, we're a free resource. Uh, give us a call, we would love to help make a plan how you can implement soil health practices on your operation. And we promote improved soil health and we do that with five uh, key principles and that's keep the soil surface covered, limit any uh, disturbance, promote diversity, maintain living roots, and then integrate livestock. So that's the website. And uh, on the website, you can find all kinds of events that we have throughout the year. Um, we have local field tours and different educational events in uh, regional areas in the state. And then we have a yearly soil health school, which is a two and a half day, very hands-on in the field. Uh, you'll learn a lot about how to interpret your soils and how to manage them. And then also uh, in the less busy time of the year, in January, we have the Soil Health Conference. And this year it will be in Aberdeen. So 2022 is in Aberdeen. Soil Health School this year is in Mitchell. And then it'll move somewhere else next year. Hey Austin. So I'm gonna, yeah. Hey, really quick. I just wanna uh, make a quick um, announcement, I guess, to the attendees. With anybody who has questions for Austin or Sean, uh, feel free, put them in the chat box and we'll get to them. And if we run out of time, um, we'll, we'll make sure we get an answer to you. So I just wanted to put that out there quick. Perfect. Nope, that's just, that's just fine. So to kind of understand where we're going and where we kind of need to know where we've been with soil management. And so uh, South Dakota was, the soils were built on the prairie. Uh, Eastern South Dakota was a tall grass prairie. And as you went west across South Dakota, it goes to a short grass prairie. And it was built with diverse uh, grasses and forbs and and grazing animals. And so then as we settled the country, uh, we had to do some tillage, do a lot of plowing, and we had to adapt and grow crops. And, and that's fine. Uh, but we need to remember that we need to keep some of those areas as grass production as well and manage our crop and our grasslands accordingly. Um, so, you know, we... In the native system, we 
Mother Nature had things figured out with diversity and limited disturbance. And so then we fast forward 150 years later, we're kind of doing the same thing um, as we were doing back when we first tore up the soil, the, the prairie. Uh, so not to offend anybody, we got a case quad track there and a John Deere quad track here. Uh, but I want you to pay special attention. Um, these, you know, this field was tilled in the fall and now this is the last spring. And as you can see, when the snow melted, you know, there was a lot of erosion. A lot of that soil left the field or it got displaced. Uh, so now they're just gonna come in and, and smooth it all out and kind of erase that erosion. And I say erase with quotation marks because uh, as you know, that's long-term not a sustainable situation because that soil is leaving. And here's another uh, picture of that. You know, you got tillage going on and, and a lot of soil blowing away. And then 2019, this was what I saw in Eastern South Dakota very often. Uh, you would see a part of a field that really should have a waterway on it or should be in grass. Uh, you know, the soil just couldn't handle um, all the water and it washed and now there's, you know, 12 inch gullies here and, and the soil gets deposited across the road somewhere else. I mean, it, that's long term, not a very sustainable situation. And then in these pictures here, I, I see it along the interstate when I'm driving across uh, the state, you'll see a lot of hilltops that are lighter than uh, the low land areas of a, of a field. And what's happened here is a lot of that topsoil is missing. It's migrated to the bottom of the hill. And as you know, the pH changes significantly up here. Uh, the nutrients and the organic matter, everything is significantly reduced as compared to the bottom of the field. Uh, so that makes a challenge. And then in Eastern South Dakota, um, I see this every spring. This is a lot of what the rivers and creeks look like. Uh, which is not a good situation either. And this map just kind of indicates um, a lot of the soils worldwide are becoming degraded. And that's ultimately why uh, people migrated to the United States for better soils. And we expanded west to get better soils because we were degrading. And uh, again, we're possibly teetering down that, that slope again of degrading. Uh, so th the point of this is so we can have the tools in our toolbox to protect against degrading our resources. And then I, I'm not immune to this either. This is uh, land that my family has had in the family for many, many years. Um, th this particular piece wasn't homesteaded, but as you can see, uh, boundary lines don't matter just because there's been a fence here forever and somebody's been farming this side forever doing tillage and, and things like that in crop production um it wasn't the best for the soil as you can see this much topsoil or this much soil is now at the bottom of the hill and that is a very significant problem and i see this on a lot of fence lines and this is just very apparent to me because i just replaced this fence last fall and it's pretty disturbing to see something like that. So in review, uh, bare soils are subject to erosion and this is what happens with wind erosion. Uh, just, it keeps breaking these soil particles into smaller pieces and then it goes airborne. And then even in the water situation, it just keeps uh, moving smaller particles down the hill. And just think about um, just a single raindrop falling out of the sky. It's going to hit that soil surface at 20 to 30 miles an hour. Uh, so if you don't have something to break that impact, it's essentially like a bunch of little explosions uh, on the soil surface and it's moving the soil particles, you know, three to five feet in any direction. Uh, so we want to protect against that and um, just keep keep something to cover and, and break that impact, such as like an old crop residue here. Um, also, moisture is a concern. Uh, if we have bare soils like this, uh, it's a lot of evaporation is, is happening. It, you know, that water is working upwards. Um, 
especially in the James River Valley, we've got salinity issues. If that water isn't used, those salts, you know, after the water evaporates, the salts are left in the soil surface. And now we've got soils that won't even grow a weed because, you know, it's just too much, you know, salt pressure for it. Um, so yeah, we want to minimize evaporation and we want to have a plant utilize that moisture. And then even varying temperatures, a, a bare soil surface is going to be a lot warmer, especially on the darker surfaces. Um, so as we go into potentially a dry season, uh, it would be more advised to keep more residue and maintain that moisture and not let it evaporate out of your system. So then I get a lot of pushback in Eastern South Dakota on um, such as like no-till corn. And this is a uh, soil temperature and a uh, growing degree units um, that was tracked in 2016 by Anthony Bly at, with SDSU and, and Eric Barsness with NRCS out of Brookings. And they, I got this thing away. They tracked um, no-till and uh, conventionally tilled soils. And as you can see, uh, the conventional tilled, it does have a warmer soil temperature when you plant. And it really did get that corn out of the ground quicker. And then it canopied quicker. So that soil surface was likely cooler. Um, and, and a lot of times that no-till corn might not look so good right here. You know, it didn't shade over, it didn't canopy as quick. But as you can see about July, you know, mid-July, that corn is right on track. Those temperatures are the same and they ended up with the same uh, heat units. And so the point is, if your corn doesn't look exactly 100% in June, uh, that's all right. You're not combining in June. Uh, that, there's a lot that can happen in the season and it, it will recover. So yeah, like I, like I said, we just wanna keep uh, plant residues. In this case, uh, this particular person in Huron that I worked with, they interceded cereal rye into the corn and this can uh, protect that soil surface for the next season. So physical dis or limiting soil disturbance. This can be a couple different ways. Um, in this case, we've got physical disturbance and that would be the form of tillage. Uh, this, all of these soils are in this very similar proximity. They're all the same soil type. This one is uh, conventionally tilled with a disc and a field cultivator. This is a fence line that is never disturbed. And then this is a fairly long-term no-till field um, with cereal rye growing in it. And as you can see, the one that's tilled, you just really don't have very good soil structure uh, and what I mean by that is the soil particles bound together and it just looks like kind of a brick or a rock. And you can see right down to the tillage layer at about six inches that this has been uh, frequently turned over and it just doesn't look as healthy. Whereas the fence line, you know, looks like soil should. And then even in the, the no-till with cover crops, you know, you, you can see these little particle, soil particles air and water can move through that soil a lot better than this situation. And you gotta remember that um, those, uh, the life in the soil builds these soil aggregates. So, you know, no form of tillage is going to build that soil structure. We need that to be a biological process. And uh, chemical disturbance can impact that as well. So if we're using a lot of synthetic fertilizers, if we're using a lot of insecticides and fungicides, that decreases the biological populations in the soil. And once again, that soil is full of life and the biological populations are incredibly important to how our soil functions and even nutrient uptake, uptake with our plants. Um, even think about mycorrhizal fungi. We probably learned about it in high school or middle school science class and then never thought about it again. Uh, but that's an intense network that is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a plant. And that plant is getting a lot of its phosphorus from that mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, so they need to be working together uh, to have a healthy plant. 
And every time we do, uh, you know, intense tillage or, um, you know, a lot of fungicides or synthetic fertilizers, uh, we're decreasing those populations. So an indication of how your soil health is uh, improving or, or moving air and oxygen and water through the soil, uh, you can do a water infiltration test and if you don't have a kit like this, feel free to give us a call. We'll get you a free one. Otherwise, uh, visit your local NRCS office and they'd be happy to give you one. And it's a nice thing to do yearly or just throughout the year to just to kind of gauge how the soil is improving or how it's changing. Then promoting diversity. That's our next step of soil health. We want, just like in the native system, we want that diverse plant community because if we have diverse plants, we have diverse animals. And when I speak about animals, that could be the ones that you see, like the birds, uh, deer, uh, other small animals, or it could be um, the microscopic creatures that you can't even see that are in the soil, that are building that soil structure. So I like to think of synergy as uh, plants working together. So in this case, we have a cowpea, uh, that's binding up a sorghum plant. Uh, both of them needed sunlight and that cowpea took advantage and it just bind up that, that uh, sorghum plant. And they're likely, if you have a healthy soil, they might be sharing some nutrients between themselves. They have different rooting characteristics, uh, things like that. And also with diversity, we can break pest cycles. So especially in Southeast South Dakota, when I hear um, all this concern about white mold and things like that with soybeans, um, we're, we really can avoid some of this uh, situation by having a, a good crop rotation. Uh, and instead of having every other year having soybeans, maybe you go every third year having soybeans. Or for the folks that are corn on corn on corn who have a lot of corn borer issues, um, having a diverse crop rotation can help break those cycles. And so when we're thinking about cover crop mixes, I like to uh, include some of each of these, uh, depending on what time of the year we're planting, of course. Uh, but, you know, to have the cool season, uh, cool or warm seasons, have grasses and broadleaves, uh, legumes, so they're fixing some nitrogen for future crop years. Uh, it's just very important to have all of those different uh, plant community communities because when we're kind of stuck in just a corn and soybean situation, we're just only hitting a warm season every single year. And we've got other seasons that something could be growing. Maintaining living roots, that's, uh, that's probably one of the most important um, parts to a healthy soil system, in my opinion. Uh, because photosynthesis drives everything. Once again, this is a real simplified uh, map of, of kind of how our ecosystem works. Um, and it's one that we probably learned and forgot about completely. But that sunlight, it is free energy that we can harness. Um, you know, instead of buying gas in your car, you know, without it, it you have to pay for it if you want to get going somewhere. Um, but the sunlight is free. Nobody's charging you anything for that. Uh, and basically, if we have a plant that's utilizing that free energy, uh, it's taking carbon in and it's putting that carbon back in the soil. Uh, so this might be new to some people, but actually, uh, as the carbon goes through the plant, it ends up down in the roots. And some of that carbon is leaked out of the roots as what they call soil exudates. And actually that is what feeds a lot of these microscopic uh, creatures in the soil. And that's part of that food system that's bringing minerals and nutrients into the plant as a plant available form. So yeah, we might go apply synthetic fertilizers, but it's really this process here for how it actually gets into the plant. Um, and so this is a very critical piece and we need to have something living you know, a plant to keep this going. And we've got a lot of different root types that can help. If you've got different compaction layers, 
Uh, there's just a lot of different rooting depths, a lot of different rooting characteristics. You know, these big fibrous root uh, systems, they can break out a lot of this surface compaction and, and even deeper. Uh, some of these brassicas will uh, take out or help remediate some of the lower line compaction issues. And uh, it's just very important to have diverse roots out there too. So back in 2019, when there was a lot of prevent plant around here, a lot of people were saying, well, why don't I just use my, let my weeds be a cover crop? And so I wanna caution you about that. Uh, this water hemp plant, obviously we don't want it to produce seeds and, and be a problem for future years. Uh, so that'd be one reason to get rid of it. Uh, the second reason would be, look at these two different roots. This root, this plant roots has um, soil particles that are bound to it. And that's exactly what I was talking about in that last picture. Those soil exudates um, attract biology and they start colonizing and building their habitat around the roots. So some of these plants species, so a lot of our common weed species do not associate with biology. And then even some of the cover crop species like brassicas uh, don't very much, but certain things like oats or, um, th there's a whole bunch of cover crop species that really do look like this. And this is a sorghum plant here too. Um, you know, and it's just, it's helping to improve our soils. It's giving a chance for that biological community. So then think about length of time your plants are growing. If you're in a corn soybean rotation, um, you know, at best, your corn varieties are generally a hundred day corn uh, around here. And so at best, we probably have 80 days that something is actively growing. Um, 80 days out of 365, that's only 20, 20, 25% of the time that something's actually growing. Um, so that's where cover crops kind of come into play. We can uh, have something growing on those seasons that maybe your cash crop isn't and keep that process going. And then our last piece is to integrate livestock. Uh, this is also very important. Our, our soils were built off of animals out grazing and, um, and you can do this a lot of different ways. You might have like a marginal part of your crop field, you know, that might be close to a pasture, close to your home operation. And you could just put those marginal areas that don't make sense to plant corn or soybeans and just put it into a diverse cover crop mix. If nothing else, you're going to build soil structure. You're going to cycle nutrients. And it also gives you an opportunity to get some income off of those acres by grazing an animal. Uh, or even just, I guess the root uh, reason of having animals is to produce protein. So, you know, not all parts of your field are, uh, should be cropped. Uh, this gives another option of how to make income off of that. And the animals just activate soil biology. So even in this winter picture, you know, it might be 20 below here, but uh, they're still adding saliva and hair and uh, urine and manure to the soil. And that's actually generating some life even in the winter. Sure, they might freeze, but um, come spring, uh, the manure and things like that is all going to still benefit the soil. And so there's just a lot of different grazing options. And, and like I was talking when we first started, it's just a lot of fun watching animals graze the cover crop. Uh, in this case, we just give them a little piece each day uh, when we were grazing this. And this is a full season cover crop that didn't make sense to plant corn on. And the cows absolutely just loved it. They, they did very well. So you were saying, well, gee, maybe I don't have um, cattle or, or have any livestock, but I would like to get the livestock benefit. Or maybe you're in the uh, other category where you would like to graze somebody's uh, crop residues or cover crops. Uh, this is a free service that the coalition has put together and you can just make a little pin on there, uh, put your name on it, uh, contact information, and just say what you're looking for. Maybe you're looking to graze, maybe you're looking to have somebody come graze animals on your land. 
Um, basically, it's just a matching service. You figure out all the details with uh, the other party and you both can mutually benefit and you could likely work out a deal of charging, getting a little income off your land or, or getting some economical grazing. Either way, it's a benefit to the soil health. Uh, then you're not overgrazing pastures and you're utilizing a forage that somebody else wouldn't have. So yeah, I guess I just put down here, um, maybe it's a different, maybe this is a way to add an enterprise uh, to your operation and have another um, younger son or daughter come back to the operation, who knows. So I'm just going to finish up with some real quick economics. I did a really high level uh, uh, analysis here, so don't, don't judge too hard, but I just took Iowa custom rates and I know everybody's machinery costs are a little different, but uh, this is a nice average again for people in Iowa, which I, I think we can probably relate on some of the machinery stuff possibly. But uh, one thing to note is the rates do include fuel, repairs, depreciation, interest on the machinery, labor, and all machinery costs for the tractor and the implement. So we're just going to strictly look at tillage systems. I, I did not, I don't have enough time to go through all the cover crop economics, but if you have questions about that, I could point you in a direction afterwards. Um, but we're gonna look at conventional tillage situation where the field was disc ripped, then they put, you know, had the co-op put out fertilizer, and then they ran the field uh, cultivator or the field finisher in the spring. And then they went through with a pre-plant herbicide and they did some land rolling. Uh, because that disc gripper pulled up a lot of rocks. I see that frequently. Uh, some folks really need to run the roller because otherwise they'll run a rock through their combine. Um, then they plant it, then they do another herbicide application and then harvest. And again, this is just machinery costs. This is not seed cost or chemical costs. This is just machinery. But we ended up with 122 bucks an acre. Okay, then another conventional tillage situation that maybe a little different, uh, disking in the fall, uh, field cultivate in the spring, they did some land rolling, uh, and then they herbicide, all this should be the same for all the, for each system. Then how about the strip tillage? Strip till, uh, herbicide plant, herbicide harvest, 100 bucks an acre, this one was 118. And then the no-till, we just got a herbicide application, fertilizer, plant, another herbicide application and harvest, 82 bucks an acre. So again, very high, you know, very, very high level uh, overview, but if everything was equal and the uh, chemical costs were the same, uh, you're looking at an additional $41 approximately. And, and again, these are average costs. So some of these could be a lot higher, some of them could be a little lower, but average 41 bucks an acre higher to do this system. 35 to 36 bucks to do this system over no-till. And then even the strip till. I, I have a lot of people that say, well, I'm going to do strip till for a few years and then go to no-till. And that's completely fine. Um, that, that might be a good way to transition. Uh, but I might even encourage you to look a little further. A strip till machine is very expensive and you need a very large tractor to run it. Uh, maybe you just jump to no-till. But um, there's a million ways of doing things. And um, you know we're here to help you figure out what might work best for your operation. And uh, you know what, it can be really scary jumping into just cold turkey going to no-till. Uh, so that's why we have a support group that can help you. And so you hopefully won't have a train wreck and can just transition into a, a system that works for you. And then take time to learn, you know, on the off season, these are some of my favorite books, I guess. And then, uh, like I said, that we have a network, uh, a connect, building connections, mentorship, uh, brochure is what they call it or booklet and basically there's all these people across the state somebody in every county that has volunteered to be a mentor 
So um, you can request, you know, give me a uh, an email or, or call me after this and I can get one of these sent out to you if you're interested. And then, yeah, we have a soil health scorecard on our website. You can kind of gauge how your soil is, is looking and then just get a shovel out there and you can really see a lot. I mean, obviously this soil looks better than this one, certainly. So I sped through that really quick, but I wanted to save enough time so we could get through what Sean, you know, hear from Sean and things like that. So with that, we can take some questions or we can move right into a discussion. There, there was one question that was in the chat box um, that Sean went ahead and, and answered, but I'll just read it out loud too, in case those who, who haven't read it or those who are on the phone. Uh, there was a question as to what is the recommend, recommended amount of different species wanted in a cover crop? Um, Sean answered that question and, um, you know, he had said that some data said that uh, eight species seems to promote symbiotic relationships and, and uh, Sean, you know, I'm sure you've got great experience with cover cropping from my discussion with you, what, a couple weeks ago. Um, so you can, you know, talk a little bit more on that if you wish. Yeah, sure. So. Austin, that was a great presentation. Thank you. That was uh, that was really important, informative. I was taking notes as you were going along there, so thanks for doing that. That was good. Um, thanks, Sean. So you know, yeah, on our operation, you know, um, nothing scientific here really. It's just uh, I kind of look at what I think we need for our resource concerns and. Um, and usually it's more cover on the soil. So I like to put in high carbon crops, but it does seem to make a difference. You know, even if I'm planting a late season cover crop, like um, winter triticale or rye or something like that, I always try to throw in something. Just you want to have something in there. I think of it, I don't know. It, a lot of us have a hard time seeing what's down below the soil. So I kind of like to think of it like the water. So if I was fishing, um, what would I put on for bait? You know, there's, you're going to put on one type of bait and catch one type of fish. But if you put on have two or three lines out and you, and you've got all these different types of bait, well, then you start to attract different things. So that's kind of the way I look at it. Um, but yeah, there's definitely, a, there's definitely a boost if you uh, have, have a few more species in there. Austin, I did have a question. Um, you know, I've kind of heard, uh, you know, call it a myth, if you will, but um, double cropping. I've always heard, you know, boy, it's going to really take a lot of nutrients out of the soil or it's going to just, you know, deplete the soil of moisture. Um, and maybe that's an old way of thinking. But I mean, it, it's something that, you know, is still being kind of thought of today, I think, anyway. Can you address on that a little bit? So I guess I see a lot of people on like social media and stuff doing like true genuine double cropping of like a small grain and then, uh, you know, like a bean crop or something like that. I, I think there is certainly opportunity for it. Um, I think a person needs to remember that every time we harvest and every time we remove seed or residue, which I, I really don't like removing any residue, but um, Every time you remove something, you are taking some nutrients with it. So that's kind of why like the grazing livestock situation is a really cool system because you really are not removing much of any nutrients. I mean, most of what the animal eats retains back in that field. Uh, so in the, in the double crop situation, just know what you're removing, you know, and, and maintain those um, soil fertility levels so you can be profitable in that operation. Um, I guess some, there's a lot of different ways that people maybe double crop, like in a, in this cover crop situation back here, I guess you could think of it as uh, a double crop in that we harvested the small grain, we drilled in the cover crop, and then the same year we are 
harvesting this forage with animals. I don't know if that kind of answered. No, it. I think I think yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, you you hit on it basically. You know, uh, double cropping. If you're taking all that is produced from that field, definitely there can be a, a nutrient deficiency um, going on. But yeah, I think that was kind of. I guess where I was steering there was more so during, you know, a small grain planted early, taken off, and then, you know, a cover crop mix like that planted in there. Um, Absolutely. There, there's definitely, I would recommend that if you're, if you're doing a small grain, I would recommend get something growing after that. Because if you're, if you're harvesting in end of July or early August, you have a huge window for something that could be growing. Now I understand in South Dakota, sometimes we don't get a rain. Um, so sometimes I hear, well, I don't wanna put something out there if it's not going to grow. And I, I totally get that. Um, but ways that you could have more success with that cover crop after a small grain, uh, if you're worried about moisture, drill it a little deeper and also follow the combine. As soon as you, as soon as you get done harvesting, get that cover crop drilled uh, you'll have way more success than if you waited two, three days or a whole week and more of that moisture evaporates. I mean, a small grain field is so hot uh, with all the, the sun beating down and, and uh, reflecting off. So getting that in there immediately is pretty critical. Well, we've got more questions coming in. I know, Sean, you're limited on time, but I'd like to hand it over to you. I don't want to miss out on what, what your story is here. Um, Sean, you and I talked a couple of weeks ago, and you kind of gave me a rundown of your operation, and you got a really cool story that, uh, that you have going on. So, um, Sean, do you mind sharing what, what you and I, I guess, talked about a couple of weeks ago? Just give us your story. Well, sure. I guess... Um might have to refresh my memory a little bit what we talked about, but uh, basically we are a cow-calf operation in Western South Dakota. So just east of Rapid City, about 15 miles. Um, we have three different places. Um, um, one that I call home is here at Caputa has about 200 acres of irrigated ground. And then the rest is, is uh, grasslands. And we do have a forest service lease that hooks onto this place. And then uh, we go about 30 miles north, a place that we just acquired here in August. Um, <clears throat> that has about 500 acres of crop ground, dry land crop ground on it. Um, that's currently in hay, alfalfa. Um, and then you go another 30 miles north from that or 35 miles north from that is kind of our up at inning. That's our kind of our, what I used to call our summer pasture. Um, but now, you know, we've changed our cabin date and, and we can calve anywhere in a, on any one of those places now and, and be fine. So um, basically what, what I found out is uh, mowing hay in this irrigated ground one year, and it was after I attended the, the Grassland Coalition Grazing School, and I was just trying to figure out, that, man, there's got to be a better way to do this, because we were, I was plugging up uh, with the wind rower, with the old sickle type wind rower and uh, so I was thumbing through my phone looking for a new wind rower and I just the price was crazy and I, I'm thinking I need a new shed to park this thing in and and the dollars just weren't making sense to me so I thought well there's there's got to be a better way to do this so um, I went to the grazing school and kind of got to talking to some guys and, and got some data on grazing irrigated ground and uh, did some more research and this was kind of before cover crops were definitely before cover crops were on the western side of the state. Um, so there was very little information on how to get started, but um, just over some talking with seed dealers and different producers and lots of seminars and lots of YouTube and kind of came up with the mix and uh, um, <clears throat> we grazed, uh, we had some winter triticale planted and it was dry that year. So we took our yearlings and, and grazed that triticale and didn't spray it out or anything. We just, as soon as the cattle were off of there, we, we went right in and no-tailed a, a full season or a warm season um, diverse mix in there. And then just stockpiled that and used it as winter feed. And 
after the first year, man, I was hooked. I thought this is way better than what I was doing. There, there was no feed wagons, no starting tractors in the winter, uh, none of that. We just moved electric fence through there and cows were putting on weight. Um, so we ended up selling all of our hand equipment. Um, we finally got out of even our feeding equipment this year, sold our feed wagon, tore out our feed bunks. Um, so it's, uh, it's been quite a change for us. It, it's been kind of a lifesaver. And kind of as Austin said, everything you do with a cow goes back to the land. I mean, up to 90% of it, you know, 80 to 90% of it goes back in the ground. And so that's what I was looking at. Um, we, we're always trying to bank something in just, you're always trying to save a nickel here or there. And a lot of times we forget that a lot of it's right under our feet. So if I can put it back in the ground, I think it'll pay us back in the, in the future. So is that kind of what you're, you're thinking, Luke, is, um, I guess we also have a pumpkin pad that we, we plant that full season cover crop now, and then we have somebody cut a maze in there for us. And, and we have people come out and try to, try to promote soil health and show them where their food comes from and, and why we planted a, a diverse cover crop versus corn for our maize and, and that sort of thing. So it's been an interesting path. Yeah, no, Sean, you nailed it. That's, uh, I just think that's so cool. Such a cool story, you know, that you're right. Hang equipment is expensive. Repairs are expensive. And, you know, it's just a, a cool story to me about how you can think outside the box and, and uh, accomplish something real positive. Um, I just love hearing that story. And, you know, and the cover crop thing, how it can, it can happen. It can uh, be a benefit in Eastern South Dakota you know, Western South Dakota, it doesn't matter. It's not, uh, uh, it's not prejudiced to one, one type of farm. I mean, it, uh, it's something that can be incorporated into any operation. So I just love that story. Um, we do have some questions. I know, Sean, you kind of hit on one about the nutrients of, um, um, you know, the cows taking nutrients from cover crops. Um, I think the question was, uh, sorry, there's a few rolling in here, so I'm just looking through them, but uh, there was a question, the biological benefits of incorporating livestock on fields, um, but the question is, don't animals remove nutri most nutrients from the field as they are marketed? Um, I guess you kind of hit on that though, as far as, you know, what was it, 90% of the nutrients are left back in the field yeah those those animals are going to defecate you know each day i think what is it 50 pounds a day i think they put you know through manure and, and urine so um and we're speaking they're, cattle they're, right yeah we're yep. speaking cattle but you know, i suppose you could look and and it's going to be a percentage of body weight that they're going to put back on the ground and you look at nutrient cycling that's everything cycles no matter what you do everything cycles and and that's way those ruminants were designed was to cycle those nutrients back into the ground um granted you are taken off uh, like like the question said if if those animals are marketed you're taking those off but um for the most part they've already left everything that they've ate back on the ground so um that rumen functions almost identical to the microbes in the soil and so like austin was saying that wintertime uh, grazing of those, you know, aftermath crops and, and that sort of thing, it's, uh, it's basically a warm spot for those microbes to function inside of the rumen and then back it on back out on the ground. So it's a really good practice to, if you can figure out a way to get cattle on the ground, it's a really good practice to start doing. And that's a great explanation that kind of helped clear up in my own mind, you know, what the benefit for having livestock is on that ground. Um, just makes complete sense how you say it's so easy. Uh, guys, I know there's a big concern um, about drought. Um, I guess looking at the extended forecast, I don't know if I can do this or not. Uh, I don't think I can, but I was looking at the drought map here and um, you know, North Dakota's getting hit pretty hard with the drought right now and I know 
uh, northwestern South Dakota too, with a forecast of it kind of spreading east. And I don't mean to be chicken little here, but I mean, we've all been through a drought. We know what it's like. And can you just talk about what it's like going through a drought and um, being conscious of soil health and other benefits? Um, I know there was one question in here and I'll just ask it. Um, what if you're in a droughty area or naturally less rain? Uh, when does it come to a point that cover crops are doing more harm than good as far as from taking moisture from the ground? I guess uh, if, if, you, if I could answer that real quick, Austin, or just take a stab at it, um, I would just say, look around. I, I am definitely in a droughty area. I'm kind of in a rain shadow right, right off the Black Hills. And, you know, I think Rapid City's average moisture is about 17 inches and ours is more like 12 here. So look around and see the native prairie or any type of prairie and, and ask that, you know, is that grass doing more harm than good? Well, it's not. It's keeping the ground covered. It's got a living root. It's keeping the biology alive, um, and it's infiltrating water. So, you know, I think the question would be: Is it doing more harm than good to the next crop? Uh, and I, I could see that being maybe an issue. But, but anytime you have something green and growing in the ground, you're doing something good. And whether it's a bumper crop or not. Um, Anytime you can keep something green and living and using sunlight, they're feeding soil biology and they're holding the soil from blowing. Um, those are all things that, that you really got to look at hard, I think, when you're, when you're asking those type of questions. I think that nailed it. Austin, do you have anything to add to that? You know, I, I personally don't live in a real... Well, it, we're in South Dakota, we all know what a drought is, but I can't relate to that as well as like Sean can, or uh, maybe like middle of the state. Um, we're blessed with usually decent rain, you know, probably like twice what Sean gets. Um, it, it's a concern. Like if you, if you have cover crops planted right now and you are going to plant green into them or something like that, um, just knowing that it's dry, you might terminate those cover crops early uh, just to protect yourself against uh, reducing your potential for your next crop. Uh, so that's something certainly you need to look into. Um, as far as like the fallow, uh, why do they fallow farm in, in parts of the country? Yeah, that, you know, the, the idea is to uh, be stockpiling, if you could say, moisture. Um, that used to be a very common practice in South Dakota, you know, and, and, and some people still do it. But I personally, I hope I don't get in trouble here, but I personally don't think that's a very good idea. Uh, just in the, in the fact that you're leaving that soil bare. Um, you know, a lot of the fallow fields I've seen have potential to uh, erode and, and blow with the wind, things like that. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can, if you're in a really dry environment, there's different ways that you can uh, protect yourself to catch more moisture. So like even if you have small grains in your rotation, having a stripper head instead of like a, uh, you know, a big straight cutting head or a flex head that cuts the whole plant, you know, the stripper head keeps all those, those, um, stock standing and it just takes the heads and so then you can actually collect moisture a little easier throughout the the winter and things like that just something to think about john you you hit it probably a little bit better than i because you have more experience with that definitely gets dry here last you know this winter was very little moisture. The winter before was very little moisture. Um, I think we just broke six inches of rain last September for last summer. So it's not looking good for this year. So you just, uh, when it comes to drought, I would just say, uh, don't wait till the last minute to make a decision. Don't, don't uh, just hope that it's gonna get better. Be, be planning, 
look ahead. Uh, I kind of, you know, you can feel it. There's just not, the rains aren't there. And for us, it's livestock. So we're just be stock. I guess if you looked at it the same way with the combine, um, just don't take everything that's on the soil. Try to leave something there to keep it shaded, covered up. And, you know, I, I have a, I kind of cringe a little bit when I see some of these, the, just the way the wind's been blowing lately and, and some of these hotter days. And then you see kind of commodity prices creeping up, which is a good thing, but it can also for us to do, make some bad decisions, I'm afraid. So I, I would just say, be careful. Um, look at look at the moisture you have in the soil profile and try to keep it there. And then even keeping that soil surface covered as much as you can just to minimize evaporation. Well, on, a, on the flip side, you know, Austin, probably in your area where you're used to moisture, um, you know, having that cover crop could probably help you retain or, or do the water infiltration too, you know, help control that water. So kind of, uh, that's yeah, probably I mean, more, more of your experience. Yeah, I guess, you know, like I'll refer to 2019 again, how wet it was. I mean, the, the guys that had cover crops or the ones that had a long-term uh, no-till, they have better soil structure. And so that structure would hold their equipment up and it wouldn't mud up the gauge wheels and things like that as a uh, traditional tilled field would. Um, so the guys that had the no-till and, and uh, they were able to get out and plant and get a crop in there. Uh, a lot of the, the bare black fields, they weren't able to get in there because it would just be too muddy and everything would just mud up on their planter. Sean, I know you were kind of uh, tight on time. Um, you know, if you got to go, we, we understand. We just want to say thanks uh, for participating. And, you know, if there's more questions that maybe need to be directed to you, is it okay if we send them, send them your way? Yep, absolutely. Um, All right. Love to have them out here. If, if you know, everybody gets out to rapid, stop in and we'll happily show them kind of our crazy operation. Um, yeah, certainly glad to be here, Luke, and thanks for your time, and good job, Austin, and thanks for everybody attending. Well, thanks, Sean. We'll, thanks, we'll probably continue trying to go through some of these questions here. Um, I, I want to try to get to everybody's. I know we're running a little tight on time here, so if we don't, we will make sure we, uh, we get in contact with you via email. Um, Austin, I think this is a really great question for you as far as cover crops. Um, there was a question about how do you deal with potentially carrying over diseases to your cash crops if you utilize diverse cover crop mixes? So yeah, I, I tried to hit that question. I, I don't know. I sometimes struggle when I type things out. I don't know if I articulated what I meant. I might have um, missed your response here too. No, no, so, you're, you're good. I, I'm glad you brought it up. So Basically, you want to um, think about the crop type that you currently have growing. So if you have, I'm just going to use corn for an example. If you have a grass, a warm season grass species like corn, and then you plant a cover crop after it, and your concern is for carrying something the next year, um, to minimize that, the host or whatever, uh, you might want to select a different cover crop species. Maybe don't select a rye or a grass, you know, that that's going to harbor and, and make a environment for those, uh, the pests to carry over in. And also, that's not the best example because like rye or winter wheat are the best overwintering cover crop species. Um, so it kind of depends on your situation, but the, the point of it I'm trying to say is alternate your crop types. So if you're doing a grass, try to go to a broadleaf. If you're doing a broadleaf cash crop, that would be a good idea to have a grass species as your next crop. And I, I get what you mean about the having a diverse mix. You're going to have grasses and broadleaves. You can have a mix. Um, maybe just throttle back 
some of those species that are very similar to your next cash crop uh, to minimize that risk. It, it's kind of tough. That, that's where every situation is a little different, but the, the key thing is when you're thinking about cover crops, have a goal in mind, be thinking ahead what you want to plant your next year, you know, your next cash crop. And it's also good to consider your last cash crop. Um, and I'd be more than happy to sit down with any of you and, and help put together a little protocol for some different crops or cover crops you have in your rotation. Um, there was a question a here. Question. I might be missing some, so I apologize. I will go through all of these questions and um, make sure we get them answered if, if we uh, skip over them in the webinar. But um, we've got a a person in attendance today that's no-tilled for over 25 years. They're very serious about soil conservation, um, but the economics of grain farming prevent them from planting cover crops because of the price of wheat and the competitive rates that they pay landlords. Um, any comment yeah, on I, that? I completely, completely understand. Um, when I look at like crop budgets, it, it's very hard sometimes to make some of these small grains pencil out outright. I, I'll be very honest. Um, and I, you know, everybody does things a little different. So where we're putting our cover crop or our small grains are usually places where we can have cattle graze on them because that's where we make the money back. I'm not saying you can't, the best soil health system, yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to have cover crop on um, every acre of small grain after you harvest it. Uh, but yes, I, I understand the margins are tight. And that's maybe where you look at, there's a lot of different ways people do things. Um, I don't know anything about this, so I'm just gonna throw this out there. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Uh, but there, there's a lot of people that used to do this with oats. Maybe it could happen with wheat. I don't know. Uh, but underseeding, you know, like when you're out drilling your wheat, I guess it depends if you're on spring wheat or winter wheat, probably winter wheat. But I'm thinking in a springtime setting like oats, if you underseeded some clovers, uh, those guys can combine the oats off and those, that clover just takes off after they harvest the oats. And so that plant is helping protect that soil and it's helping biology uh, keep maintaining life in the soil. And then also that plant is fixing nitrogen and you might be able to, you know, put a small grain back into it the next year, uh, put a corn crop into it the next year and you'll already have a little bit of nitrogen there. Again, I don't know, maybe I'm completely wrong on if that's something that could feasibly work, but it'd be neat to try it on a little lake, you know, a few acres just for the heck of it. Well, and like you said though, Austin, I mean, every situation is different too. And, and I don't know in this particular situation, but maybe it's one of those deals where the, uh, is the grazing exchange would come into play too. You know, if, if they don't own cattle by chance, I mean, maybe there's an opportunity to make an extra, you know, an extra little income um, by grazing yeah, that too. Um, of course, I don't know everybody's true. specific situation, but. Yeah, it, yeah, and, and if there's like some real specific questions like that, and, and I didn't, if I totally butchered that uh, answer, feel free to email or call and I'd, I'd be happy to visit. And, and even that's where like the mentorship brochure you know, there's a lot of people in Central South Dakota that are implementing some of these practices. And so that, that's the biggest thing that I've found with the coalition has been a lot of fun. A lot of these farmers are just very open in saying, hey, this is what's worked for me, or this is a total train wreck, don't do that. Um, but they just share and they, it can really help a person uh, from maybe making a, a wrong decision. And I'm going to make a plug on it too here, but I know it's backwards here, but it's building connections. Um, you know, Farmers Union is involved with the soil health as well. 
Um, and one of our things is trying to bridge the connections between producers. And this is just a great resource uh, of mentors and voices for soil health in South Dakota. So people have questions. I mean, there's, like Austin said, there are, there's, there's someone from every county in the state here that um, that's a resource if you've got ideas or questions about what you could do. And if you want to be a mentor, um, contact Austin or myself and we can uh, we can get you hooked up that way too to help other people. Um, well, we've been, you know, even some of these, um, yeah, like COVID has been a real, you know, unique situation for everybody. But uh, as we transition back to having events in person, you know, that's some of the best learning is when you get a group of 20 farmers sitting around and somebody says, hey, this is what issue I'm having. And everybody just starts throwing out ideas. To me that I've been really lucky working for the coalition, getting to sit in on a lot of those things. I've, I've learned a bunch from all kinds of people. So maybe take, you know, this winter, like January or something like that. If, if you see some different conferences coming up, um, consider going to some of those because you'll gain more than just listening to a couple speakers. You know, you can network with other people and uh, bring up some of these ideas and yeah. come up with some good ideas. I think you're exactly right. Just um, talking and listening to other people's experiences, you learn so much. And, uh, you know, it's pretty invaluable. And to make that connection, you know, for future resources too. I'm I'm really sorry, everyone. We're we're right at our hour time frame. I don't want to take up too much more of Austin's time. I know he's a busy guy too, but um, I hope I hope this was beneficial to just try to explain why soil health does matter and and you know it does it, it can very much have an economic impact on your operation. Um, you know, just as Austin kind of talked about to the. Uh, South Dakota grazing exchange or, you know, just overall increased nutrient um, nutrients in your soil, your, your biologicals within your soil help reduce some input costs for you too. Obviously, Austin hit on uh, conventional tillage versus no tillage. So um, there's dollars to be saved and, and potentially dollars to be made too. So um, that's a big reason I think a lot of people um, might have some interest in it. But also it's just, you know, it's for our future generations too. You know, we got to leave this land better than how we found it. So who knows, maybe we'll, we'll continue this conversation, Austin. I know uh, COVID, like you said, has limited some in-person conversations, but thank God we have technology. So it's been great. Yeah. But um, I know we missed some questions on here. We'll go through them. We'll make sure that we get them answered. Um, Austin, I, I can't thank you enough for being with us today and hopefully uh, in the future we can we can do it again. So well thanks a lot, Luke. And and thanks everybody for tuning in. And yeah, if you have more questions, go to the website. Get in, you know, you'll find our contact information too. So and this has been recorded, so we'll make sure we get it on our uh, on our website as well. Well, thanks, Luke. All right. Thanks, Austin. I appreciate everybody being here today. Take care. Have a nice spring.